Welcome back, everyone, as we dive into part three of the South Sea Bubble. If you haven't seen the first two episodes of my reaction, there's a link in the description. It'll take you back to the beginning. I want to say welcome and thank you to all of our new patrons. We had quite a few new ones that have signed up in the last few days. It's because of you that I'm able to do things like I am doing later today. I'm heading toward Maryland tonight. I'm going to be staying uh, not far from the Antietam Battlefield tonight. I'm going to be hitting the battlefield first thing in the morning and uh, spending the next four days uh, making content for the channel with the help of all of our patrons. So thank you for that. Uh, as always, the original content for this video from Extra History is in the description. Please check that out. And uh, hit that like button if you want to see more like this. Let's dive in. Last time we left off, John Blunt had just found a new way for the South Sea Company to make money. And since the company still wasn't making a single cent in the South Sea, it was time for him to roll the dice on perhaps one of the most ambitious financial schemes in history. He was going to take on the now impossibly large 31 million pound unconsolidated debt that the government had racked up by 1719. If successful, this would, beyond any doubt, make the eight-year-old South Sea Company the biggest financial institution in the world. It would also make anybody associated with the South Sea Company wealthy on a scale we can't even comprehend today. So my question is during all of this, and I don't understand enough about what's going on in history at this point, is there no one in the British government who sees the issue here? Now I understand this is a time in history uh, when the government doesn't look like it does today. We don't really have a functioning prime minister yet. Uh, we're about to have that role, and I know who it is, and I know that we're going to talk about him more and more. But, um, you know, so I guess as long as the king is supporting this, King George, uh, I guess probably not a lot of people are going to speak up. But, man, there had to have been somebody who was screaming from the rafters what a horrible idea this was. Hey, we covered this a bit last time, but just to refresh, the scheme was this. The government would allow the South Sea Company to issue an amount of stock equal to the value of the debt. How much stock that was would be calculated off whatever the share price was at the time the law was passed. So, for example, if the government's debt had been £10,000 and the South Sea Company stock had been worth £10 a share, they'd have been allowed to issue 1,000 new shares of stock. £10,000 of government debt, £10,000 worth of stock. The South Sea Company would then offer debt holders the opportunity to exchange their government debt for that stock which would have seemed like a pretty good deal to those debt holders at the time, given how successful the South Sea Company appeared. And so at that point, what you have is you have something backing that stock price, right? The amount of money that is owed by the government to the company is equal to the amount of money uh, in shares that they're giving out. So all kind of makes sense at that point, but of course it doesn't stay that way. The catch was that the South Sea Company would offer debt holders to exchange their debt for the current value of the stock. This means that if the price of South Sea stock continued to rise, they wouldn't have to trade as much stock for the debt as the government had calculated, allowing them to sell off the rest of the stock at market value and just keep the profit for themselves. So say those hypothetical 10 pound shares happen to increase in value to 20 pounds each. The company would only have to sell 500 of their new 1,000 shares to cover the government debt now. And now here's the problem, because now there's the opportunity for greed. Because if you're one of those stockholders, and you know that driving up the price of the stock puts money in your pocket, what's to stop you from doing anything you want? to make that stock price artificially inflate, which is, I think, what happens. After which, they could just pocket the extra money they made selling off the rest. That's a pretty good scheme, and with a staggering 31 million pounds of debt on the market, the possibilities here are ludicrous. If they could even manage to raise their share price by a single pound, it could possibly net them a return on a scale of hundreds of thousands of pounds. Today, the equivalent value would easily be somewhere in the tens to hundreds of millions of dollars. But before they could rake in the money with such a scheme, they needed to convince the government to let them consolidate the debt. And by convince, I mostly mean bribe. With so much potential profit at stake, the size of those bribes were set to match. With Yeah, I mean, if you are, let's say, you're set to make a billion dollars if the stock price goes up. It's not a bad investment to give out a couple hundred million in bribes because you know how much you're gonna make. And so, yeah, I mean, as long as you've got the capital ahead of time to be able to send out the bribes, 
See, this is, I know that a lot of my fellow uh, people who uh, lean the same way politically as me tend to oppose government regulation. And I oppose excessive government regulation too. I think the government should regulate as little as possible while still making sure that it's a, you know, the things are legit. But this is a perfect example of why you need some kind of regulation because this is just all going on. There's nobody stopping the bribing from happening. There's nobody stopping the company from uh, being dirty to drive up the cost. You've got to have something overseeing all this so that it doesn't happen again. And yet, even with what we have, it still kind of happens sometimes. With individual members of parliament receiving upwards of a million dollars in today's money for their vote. Jeez. But when the then Chancellor of the Exchequer, John Aislaby, presented it to parliament, parliament just sat there silent. The proposal was nearly too ludicrous for anybody who hadn't been generously bribed to take in. But inevitably, when they recovered from the shock of the proposal, rather than reject it outright, they simply started to debate whether the debt should go to John Blunt's South Sea Company, or perhaps instead to the Bank of England. As these were both Whig-controlled institutions at this point, it was really just a matter of getting the best deal. For some, that meant the best deal for the government, and for others, it was the best deal for them, personally. So it's, all, it's, it's gonna happen. Somebody's taking on this debt, because they all recognized they couldn't hang on to the debt themselves. Something had to be done. It's just a matter of what. To, oh my gosh. And imagine being one of the ones who is in Parliament who didn't get the sweet bribe, and then finding out about those bribes. I mean, how angry would you be? As this wrangling was occurring, Blunt thought up an even better way of incentivizing members of Parliament to see his way. Instead of straight up bribing people, which was A, far more dangerous to do, B, sometimes required cash up front, and C, didn't give them any long-term benefit, give Blunt stock. struck on the idea of selling MPs stock, with the special caveat that they only had to pay for the stock upon its sale. This required no cash from the South Sea Company, was arguably legal if you wildly stretch your interpretation of the law. So this just keeps getting better. Now it isn't costing him anything to even bribe the people. He just gives out a few more shares of this worthless stock that they think is going to be worth a lot. And then they'll sell it, they'll make a ton of profit, and somebody else will be left holding the bag and meant that the MPs only made money if South Sea stock rose, which would hopefully keep them interested in seeing it continue to rise. Even more beneficial, as these new high-ranking officials were seen publicly buying into the South Sea Company, it- This is why, by the way, uh, at least in the United States, when, say for example, somebody gets elected president of the United States and they own a bunch of different stocks and companies, it has to go into a blind trust where that uh, president doesn't have access to be able to buy and sell shares in particular companies. They can't make any decisions about their investments because the, the opportunity for corruption there is too great as president uh, or even anywhere one in some regulatory role in Congress or in government. Uh, you know, they have too much influence to be able to kind of make decisions that might drive up the price of stocks that they own. And so that's why that kind of thing's not allowed now, or shouldn't be. It convinced a number of other officials and members of parliament to actually buy in as well. There was only one last point of opposition to overcome, and that was Robert Walpole, a man Blunt had previously gotten locked up. Walpole wanted to have the government set the price at which shares could be exchanged for debt, regardless of their eventual market value. This would have completely destroyed the profit potential of Blunt's whole scheme. Blunt's manipulation of the House of Commons won out in the end, though, and the deal ultimately went through with slightly more favorable terms for the government and the South Sea Company paying a few million pounds for the privilege. The South Sea Company got the right to consolidate the remaining unconsolidated government debt. Walpole didn't totally lose out, though. Behind the scenes, even he had been picking up cheap government debt in anticipation of the share swap. He wasn't going to let something petty like getting locked up in the Tower of London keep him from making a little money out of this. Throughout this process, everything was coming up roses for Blunt and the South Sea Company. By March, the share price had risen to oh 330 gosh. pounds. By April, though, the company's share price began to slide, and Blunt couldn't have that. After all, the company's only source of revenue was an increasing share price, so he stepped in with yet another ingenious scheme. He Listen to what he said again. The company's only source of revenue it was an increasing share price, so he stepped in with yet another ingenious scheme. He offered to sell the stock in the same way you might a used car, 20% down and regular payments on the remainder every two months, which allowed people to buy far more stock than they could actually afford. 
Unlike a used car, though, the stock price could go up, and so long as it did, all people had to do was sell their purchased stock every two months, and they could cover their initial purchase and keep the profit. This resulted in many people owning five times as much South Sea stock as they could actually pay for. And when they did profit, much as Blunt expected, many of them simply reinvested whatever they made to do it all again in the next- Alright, so this is obviously, we know what an absolute disaster this is. But you gotta give Blunt credit for being ingenious in finding these kinds of ways, coming up with these schemes to drive up the price. Uh, I'm curious to know how this ends up for him personally when the bubble does finally burst. Is he left holding the bag or is he already gotten out from under his shares by that point? Next two months, this helped push the price of South Sea Jeez. stock even higher. And by the time the Royal Seal was on the debt swap agreement, the share price had risen to a oh ludicrous 550 pounds. Now, technically, this agreement, the South Sea Act, explicitly forbid Blunt from selling more stock until the company began to trade its stock for debt. But since most of Parliament and the King himself were making a killing, nobody seemed to remember this clause at the time. As the weeks wore on, though, despite all of these shenanigans, the share price began to waver. So Mr. Blunt proposed to the board of the South Sea another Company plan. yet another novel plan. Why don't we use all this profit we've made to lend money to people wanting to buy South Sea stock? They were going to offer a loan. Everything he does, it all goes back to selling more stock. I mean, that is literally the business of this company. They're not doing anything. They're not producing goods. They're not offering really any kind of a service. All they're doing is selling more stock. It's like a dang pyramid scheme. Loans of up to £3,000 to individuals looking to buy into the South Sea Company. This is getting really close to the point of paying people to buy their stock. But it had the desired effect, and the stock continued to rise. Seeing the meteoric rise of the South Sea Company, everybody wanted to get into the stock market game. Companies all over Britain began selling stock to raise capital. Some of these were legitimate enterprises, which were established to develop sections of the British economy that... But the problem is, when you're legit you're not going to be able to see those kinds of profits on your stock because you're legit. Uh, and so they probably get into the game thinking they're going to have the same thing happen. But eventually, I mean, there's only so much money to go around, right? People just can't keep buying stocks and everything. It hadn't taken off yet, simply due to lack of capital. Others offered such exciting products as a device to draw the vapors out of human brains or a flying machine to be developed in the near future. But as Blunt finally began to actually convert the government debt to South Sea stock, the government, probably at the behest of Blunt and crew, began to crack down on these new ventures. You see, if money was being invested in these other new ventures, it meant there was less money to invest in the South Sea Company. That's the staggering scale that South Sea is at by this point. Wow. They have to worry that there is not enough money in the entire country to support their share price yep. and have other companies on the market. So, in a feat of unfathomable irony, to defend the profitability of the South Sea Company, the government began to close down those other startups for unwarrantable practices. Wow. Unfortunately, this had the opposite effect that Blunt desired. As these other companies failed, the people who invested in them lost a great deal of money and began to sell their South Sea stock in order to cover their debts. But for right now, the stock was still on the rise overall, and with no rivals on the market and a fresh injection of loans from Blunt, South Sea shares skyrocketed Holy from cow. 503 pounds to 830 pounds apiece over the course of a week. Yet all was not actually well for South Sea. Between the copious bribes, the annuity payments, the loans, and the dividends, South Sea had spent over eight and a half million pounds up. over a handful of months. And because many people were only paying 20% of their share price for their shares now, the company had little in reserve. It will inevitably catch up to you. If you cheat long enough, if you think you can scheme, if you think you can manipulate, it'll seem good for a while and you kind of get like a high off of it, right? You're like, wow, look at how this is working. We've got the stock up to like eight times what it was. And and you just keep thinking you can double down and you're never going to get bit. But then the higher you go, the further you have to crash. Oh man, this is going bad. And it's going to go bad fast, I think. Despite the shaky state of things behind the scenes, Blunt was given a knighthood in June and made a baronet. And wow. the South Sea Company made plans to move to opulent new offices down the street from its old rival, the Bank of England. Soon the company would be valued at close to 300 million pounds, ten times the amount of government debt they were originally supposed to take on. 
And due to the loans and the low money down share price offers, they would be owed about 60 million pounds, more than the total amount of money in the economy of Britain. Just to put this in perspective, if a company had that ratio of valuation to national economy in the modern day US, it would be worth $85 trillion. Apple, the highest valued company in the world right now, is sitting at about two thirds of one trillion. Wow. And they actually make money. <laughs> As you might have guessed, the center cannot hold. This type of fanciful madness can only be sustained for so long. Yep. And even as the company is reaching its peak, people are beginning to realize just how out of kilter things really are. Join us next time to watch the bubble burst and to see the consequences for our reputable Mr. Blunt and all the other players. Yeah, I'm really curious to see how this all shakes out for him and what happens. Man, what a disaster in the making. I'm, I, what breaks my heart with all of this is that just a handful of people uh, probably end up skating out of this with a whole lot of money and a whole bunch of other people end up broke. It's kind of like these Ponzi schemes that have happened more recently. And, you know, these single individuals or small groups of people who uh, just make billions and leave a bunch of other people with nothing uh, and just devastated. It's, uh, it's very sad. So we have to remember that when we're watching this is that while it's a story and we can shake our head and say, what, you know, how stupid can you be and all this stuff, real people are affected by this. Real people are going to be destroyed by this. So curious to see how it all plays out. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. I'm going to be recording the entire rest of the series today because I'm headed to the Antietam Battlefield tonight. So hope you enjoy. We'll see you again soon. Thanks for watching.